Now, if you also happen to lose your connection, you can use the same registration to get back into this webinar and it went to your email to be able to rejoin. In case you're not aware, part of the reason we're hosting this webinar is because this is actually Invasive Species Awareness Week here in Washington. Um, invasive species, they pose a significant threat to our economy and our environment here in Washington. And we really need your help to prevent and address this issue. Everybody has a role to play. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pass this webinar off in a moment over to Dr. Chris Looney and how he can tell you about the work that he's done with invasive species and how he continues to work with our department, learning more about them and continuing in with the research. With that being said, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you, Chris. Okay, thanks. I'm going to share screen. All right, you just check in with me. Does that just look like a regular slideshow now, Cassie? Yep, we're seeing the right version. <laughs> All right. I hope so. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, so like Cassie said, I, I would like to just sort of give you a rundown of, of really the research projects that WSDA has engaged in, along with a whole lot of collaborate collaborators over the last two years, focusing a little bit um, more intensely on some of the stuff we did this summer. The um, the work is all very much still in progress. Uh, we're still analyzing just enormous amounts of data. Um, but at the end of the day, what we hope that this will do is, is provide a lot of insights into how hornets behave on the landscape, uh, where on the landscape they live, where on the landscape they come from, and improve both our ability to track and uh, eradicate them, and and also like share these lessons and share this knowledge with any any future giant hornet incursions. Uh, there's no reason to think that there won't be more. Um, I'm going to quickly just give the briefest overview of how the survey and ERAD project has gone in Washington from 2019 to today, just to get us all caught up on then these other sort of bullet points are the main foci of, of the research we've done. That includes understanding what giant hornets eat, um, trying to improve the ability of, of the traps we have, the lures that we are using in those traps, understand where our mandarinia populations come from. It's a species that ranges pretty widely um, in, in Eastern Asia. And so there are lots of opportunities, lots of places that might have originated and, uh, and then to better understand foraging behavior and perhaps dispersal ability. First of all, just I want to acknowledge all the uh, collaborators on this. We have a bunch of different institutions that have been working on us, uh, working with us, including uh, Kyungpook National University in South Korea, uh, staff from Totori University in Japan, Certainly USDA APHIS has been very involved at the local and national level. Uh, USDA ARS is the Agricultural Research Services. Uh, and this is scientists in the Temperate Tree, Fruit and Vegetable Research Unit right over the mountains in Wapato, Washington, Washington State University, and then of course WS, WSDA. So here are most, most but not all of us. Um, so again, to, to recap, in 2019, you probably recall that there was a nest located in Canada uh, up here in Nanaimo that was eradicated uh, in, say, August of 2019. And by Christmas of that year, or the New Year, I suppose, we had had at least five other confirmed hornet sightings in Washington and, and just over the border in Canada. And that, were, that, that included two hornets that were taken from a killed beehive, a hornet that was captured flying around a beehive, a hornet that was found on somebody's porch, which is the one that really started it all for Washington State, uh, and then a photograph from White Rock, White Rock, BC. And that got all of us collectively um, into the mode of, of trapping and trying to find out where the hornets were in the landscape. On the left, you see Washington State Department of Agriculture's trap sites, so a pretty regular one kilometer grid in Whatcom County, um, so uh, with some in Bellingham, and these were based on where the hornet sightings were. There was a queen found in Bellingham. And then the community science uh, trapping program that included residents of Washington, other collaborating, collaborating governments, um, and really just an enormous effort that, that spanned the state, although it was concentrated in Western Washington, which makes the most sense based on habitat modeling and um, and where our hornet detections were. And at the end of that, we located one more nest that is buried under these pink dots right here. It's sort of yellow thing peeking out close to the border. Um, and over the season collected 34 hornets. And, you know, a lot of those came from right around the nest, um, but you can see that they were pretty spread out as well. Some in Birch Bay area, that one in Bellingham in the spring 
uh, evidence that we had to keep on doing our trapping program. In 2021, it was very much the same. You see the Washington State Department of Ag expanded our grid eastwards, uh, trying to really pick up most of the county um, up into the foothills. And the community science effort still going gangbusters, contracting a little bit, which makes sense, um, a little bit more concentrated in the places close to where our hornet detections were. And by the end of 2021, we had found three nests this time, all located within a couple miles of that first nest, but only 11 confirmed hornets. And you can see that they are much, they were much more concentrated, uh, almost all of them lo located just near those nest sites. 2022, the year we're just, oops, hold on, I did something, there we go. The year we're just figuring, finishing up, uh, WSDA's grid looks about the same, you know, again, coast, coast to foothills, one trap every square kilometer. Um, the community science program has really contracted and is, and is concentrating their efforts um, in the Bellingham area. People also might have other stuff to do now that we're not all sitting around at home uh, avoiding getting sick. And the end game of 2022 was not a hornet found and no nests. Uh, this is great news, right? That is way better than if we had found 12 nests, which would have been a a scary increase from four nests or three nests the year before and one nest the year after that. But it does still leave us like, you know, I, mean, I think our, our take is that we were cautiously optimistic because we also know that um, that our, our trapping and our, our, uh, our survey approaches um, have have some aspects to them that that make us wonder a little bit if, if a zero confirmed hornet um, just if, if a hornet slipped by us. And so that's what some of the research that we've been doing for the last two years is hopefully going to improve. Uh, and the first of these, and this one is kind of done, is uh, is actually a paper that was just just accepted into publication. Insights into the prey of Vespa mandarini in Washington State, obtained from metabarking a larval feces, uh, otherwise known as what are these hornets eating? Um, we'll just cut to the easy language instead. So we know from their in their native range that they are specialists on other social hymenoptera. They certainly eat honeybees, uh, both Western honeybees and Japanese or Asian honeybees. They eat beetles, katydids, praying mantises, kind of whatever they can catch. Um, specialists, again, on social hymenoptera. And until, uh, for obvious reasons, until this program started, we hadn't really studied uh, their diets outside of their native range and certainly not in North America. This data about what they eat in their native range was, was hard won by people standing around with nets, much as I'm doing in this picture to the right, and catching hornets when they fly back uh, from a foraging trip uh, with the prey that they're gonna feed their larvae. And you end up with stuff like this. So these are pictures of, of this exact same technique and results um, conducted in Korea this summer. Sometimes you get recognizable stuff. This is a praying mantis. This one's a honeybee right down here. Over here is a Vespa velotina, the one with this hornet with the yellow legs. That's actually an invasive hornet in, in Korea and Europe. Um, almost an entire yellow jacket, but you also get a lot of this stuff, which, you know, it's your guess as much as mine, what those actually are. And in fact, that's sort of what we got when we stood around with this, um, this net trying to catch things. We got these, these chewed up gooey bug pellets, a few of which could be identified morphologically. Like we know looking under the microscope that a couple of these were uh, bald faced hornets, but a bunch of them, you can't tell that they're anything other than some sort of yellow and black yellow jacket. We have approaches to dealing with that, uh, and that is using DNA to identify the species. And in fact, we could use that efficient DNA te technique to identify what they eat um, much more effectively than trying to catch uh, hornet prey items. And that's this idea that we can do meta barcoding on larval frass. So the larvae, as they're growing in the nest, live in these cells. Uh, and you can see all the, this is nest one, uh, the one that was found in 2020. Uh, yeah, 2020. Um, they live in the cells, the cells are open, the hornets fly in, um, give them, you know, feed them their gross little uh, bug pellets that they bring back. And then once the larvae are ready to, uh, um, to molt and turn into a pupae, they build these, these caps right here, and then they dump all of their waste material. Um, it, it collects in the bottom of the cell. We call it a meconium, not much different than the, the first poop that a human baby takes. And I just want to do a quick shout out to Dr. Alan Smith Pardo, who recommended we try this, and Ruthie Danielson of Whatcom County, who ensured that we had this first nest to try it on. Uh, and what this trying it on, or, or what we were trying to do, was to harvest this poop from the cells, um, and then use the barcoding techniques, the same kind of barcoding techniques we would use on Un, un or on, on uh, unidentifiable pellets of bug to figure out what they are. And to do this, we collected uh, 800 or so fecal pellets uh, by taking them out of the nests and putting them into tubes. And so here, where my, in the upper right corner, you can see uh, uh, 
a comb cell that's been opened and the little pile of meconium collected at the bottom. That's what this looks like down here by the forceps. Once it's um, removed from the nest, a pretty uh, self-contained, hard-packed uh, bunch of weird, it looks like ash kind of, if, if you were to take it and crumble it in your fingers. Um, and we could even get some from the larvae themselves as they were dying. But mostly it was this effort of removing frass from the tubes, um, from the cells and collecting the tubes. Then it goes into a whole bunch of magic. It, uh, basically, the, this approach has been called barcoding. We use DNA to identify the species, <laughs> species, species, identify the species to species. I should say specimens to species. Um, it's been described much how barcodes are used to identify products in a store. The difference being that uh, to get to your DNA barcode, you have to extract DNA. You have to run it through polymerase chain re uh, reaction cycles to make many, many copies of the DNA. Um, pile it all into some sort of multi, um, multi-referenced goo that can be then sent to this giant machine at Washington State University to be sequenced. Uh, so a little bit more challenging than just barcoding, um, barcoding packets of stuff at, at Target. Uh, and, th and then the DNA that we're using for this is the cytochrome oxidase one region. It's it's in all of our DNA. It's a it's it's part of your uh, mitochondrial DNA, and it's been found to be pretty consistent among species. So by looking at just this one section, we can usually come up with a species ID by comparing it back to known known sequences for known species. Um, what you get at the end of that is an enormous pile of data. Um, in this case, we had 200 gigabytes of raw data, which Talissa Wilson, the lead scientist on this, likened to 30,000 PowerPoints. So imagine sitting through 30,000 of these presentations with me to find out what uh, something eats. Uh, that 30,000 PowerPoints is about a million DNA sequences. And this is kind of how they look. They just end up with this enormous, uh, these enormous databases or, or sort of spreadsheets that then have to be compared nearly individually back to uh, a master database. At the end of that, what we find is not much different than what we would expect from the native range. They feed on a range of species. Some of you have seen this data before. They've only been updated a little bit. Um, kind of anything that makes sense for them to uh, capture while they're out flying around and encountering them. Uh, certainly, it's the the number of DNA. The DNA that we were able to retrieve from those uh, from the frass was dominated by other social hymenoptera, basically every yellow jacket that occurs in our area, lots of uh, honeybees. Um, and lots of European paper wasps. And in fact, those three species, uh, bald-faced hornets or Dolica vespula maculata, uh, Western honeybees and European paper wasps were in nearly every sample and certainly dominant in every single nest. Um, see, and here's a more simple way to maybe look at that. These are graphs, accumulative graphs for three of the nests, the fourth nest, or the, uh, yeah, the fourth nest, which is technically nest number, number three. Uh, we only got the data back a little while ago. Those samples were lost in Memphis for a long time. Um, they were shipped to Memphis before they could make it to Washington State University. I don't understand the logistics there. Uh, it, but you can see that for all of these, more than half of, of the food comprised social hymenoptera. So they're certainly eating yellow jackets and wasps and honeybees just like they would in their native range. Um, this technique has to my knowledge, only been used uh, on giant hornets this one time. Uh, it's been used to look at what invasive paper wasps in New Zealand eat. It's been used to look at what the introduced species Vespa velatina is eating in uh, Europe. So it has a lot of functionality. And one thing we were able to do uh, this summer, oh, I should have prefaced this. We spent a lot of time this summer setting up research in Korea, and the work we were doing in Korea really bleeds into all the different parts of this. So it's going to keep popping up randomly. So just so you know, we were in Korea and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But while we were in Korea, we were able to remove two wild nests near Andong. This is sort of the central part of um, the Republic of Korea. Uh, and we also re removed an experimental nest that I'll talk about in a little bit. And we then sat in our hotel room, took all of the living stuff out so that we could safely transport these back to the United States. And we will be doing the same uh, sort of fecal metal barcoding to see um, to see what kind of to, to see what the prey base is in Korea, and in this case, we have these nests that are in different places. So we have one that's up on a on a hill in a multi-use area, one that's right along a riverbank, and then one that was in a forest surrounded by a squash farm. So um, it'll be interesting to see if there's any local variability in, in the kind of foods they eat that can be detect, detected with this technique. Now, where we are today, we have done a pretty good job of of thoroughly sampling all of the nests collected in Washington State, and that's nest one, two, three, and four. Um, and South Korea is in progress. So I think they're prepping that library right now. One of the goals of this um, 
uh, of this attempt to understand what the hornets eat is is to see if we can use that to develop better hornet traps and more specifically better hornet lures. The traps themselves work great, um, but it would be so wonderful to have a lure that that we know is super specific to hornets and irresistible to hornets. And that's something that's eluded, eluded us so far, but we have this crack team of researchers, uh, Dr. Jackie Serrano, USDA ARS, that's in, she's in Wapato, uh, Dr. Hideshi Naka in Totori University, Japan, and Dr. Moon Bo Che, um, a researcher at Kyungpyuk University in uh, Korea, and also a, a Vespid expert who's doing a lot of work on the invasive Vespid Valentina in Korea. Um, they are collaborating to help us test the lures that Jackie Serrano develops, um, the, the experimental lure she comes up in a place where there's actually hornets. We've been doing this in Washington state for several years now with the obvious drawback that we kill the hornets as soon as we find them and haven't found that many to begin with. So um, so it's always tricky to, to study an animal in a place where it doesn't really live when you're trying to remove it as quickly as possible. Uh, so it's great that we have these collaborators in Japan and South Korea, um, the two parts of its native range that seem most likely to be where the hornet came from. There is a lot to unpack with this project, and so I'm not going to say much um, other than the approaches that were used so far were one, to identify things that hornets eat, such as honeybees or paper wasps, um, and then collect smells essentially from hornets or from honeybees and paper wasps and use those to try and build a, a, a lure that mimics uh, a beehive. And the idea there is that as a hornet's out flying around looking for food, uh, and we know that they feed on honeybees a lot, then maybe that will be attracted to them. Um, and, and they'll just have to go to it. That it happens through a couple of different ways. Um, you can collect, uh, these are headspace volatile collections. In this case, we're collecting, uh, Jackie's collecting information from hornets themselves or, or the smells from hornets themselves. Uh, you just leave them in there and kind of shake them up a little bit and whatever, whatever they off gas gets collected and sucked into these tubes. And then it goes away into chemistry magic. Uh, this is the same thing that's happening here on the right. This is a hornet that has been also agitated in a jar um, she is trying to get out of the jar and is dropping right there some venom at the same time. Uh, and that venom is coming out of this sort of huge gland. Um, and if, if you work with insects much, this is a, like several times the size of a honeybee venom gland, for instance. Um, anyway, stuff in this huge gland. And the reason that's interesting is hornets use things from um, these glands as, as alarm pheromones. So to recruit their sisters that something is going on and you need to come investigate it. And usually what's going on is somebody's messing with the nest and you need to come and sting them. But either way, it gets the hornets really aroused and they respond to that chemical. We know it's biologically significant. So Jackie created several uh, lures. Um, there were things based on honeybee volatiles, things based on uh, bacterial mat volatiles, because those have been shown to be attracted to other Vespa species. Uh, isobutanol and acetic acid is a, is a really simplified compound that is widely active in Vespidae in general. Uh, and then these special lures that that she developed based on the um, the alarm, the presumed alarm pheromones. So one was an alarm pheromone compound published in the 90s by Ono et al. And so she recreated that. Uh, and then the second one was compounds that she identified from giant hornets we collected in Washington uh, in the years that we had them. And then that's what you saw in that previous video. Um, a lot of them didn't work. Uh, the little yellow stars indicate that they caught nothing. Um, and Honestly, none of them captured more than the orange juice and rice wine traps uh, that our colleagues ran side by side with these in, um, in Korea and Japan. So a little disappointing on this front, but some interesting things did happen. One is, even though it didn't capture more lures than, or more hornets than the, um, the, the orange juice and rice wine traps that they were compared to in, in Japan, um, Jackie's alarm pheromone version two, the one she synthesized herself, caught a lot of hornets, uh, mostly males, 282 males, which isn't super great for our program. Um, males don't start to emerge until the end of the colony cycle. And so we would ideally like to catch things that aren't males earlier in the season. Uh, but even, even the non uh, males that were captured, 40 were quite a lot. And that was just on a couple of traps. So something is going on there and that will form I think a lot of the research program coming on uh, in, in um, coming up this summer, and there are some biological reasons that this makes sense, particularly for all these males. The males will travel from hive to hive or nest to nest, if you will, uh, looking for new queens um, to try and mate with. 
And so it makes sense that they would be attracted to the smells of a giant hornet nest, including alarm pheromones, much the way um, we hope that they would be attracted to to honeybee smells or something like that. So, so that part's pretty straightforward. The intriguing bit is that it caught a lot of workers. So more work coming up in the future with hornet lures. Uh, Jackie will be traveling to Korea and Japan to oversee herself some of these uh, some of these experiments, uh, and then do what's called electro antennagram work. This is um, this is very much like a mad scientist approach to understanding chemical ecology of insects, and that is where you can cut off the poor little antenna of the hornet, glue it to a um, or, or fix it to a structure that measures the um, the electrical stimulation of that antenna when a when a compound that um, that is recognized or that elicits a response uh, is is encountered by that antenna, and you can use those to really sort of dial in on which parts of, for instance, this lure combination make the most biological sense. Uh, and once you do that, you can create a very very refined lure and also make it uh, much more concentrated. So, lots of uh, lots of work coming out this summer. Uh, one of the other goals we've had, and this one is is coming close to completion as well, is is really determining the origin of Vespa mandarinia populations. Um, you may recall the very first uh, hornet that was found was quickly analyzed by Talissa Wilson in our lab and some collaborators across the world, um, and it was determined that it was probably that it was most similar to um, some genetic genetic sequences, genetic information from South Korea. Uh, and then the, the single specimen that was found in Canada or sequenced in Canada was most um, similar to specimens from Japan. The, the problem with this analysis and one that's um, acknowledged in the paper is that this is a very, very small data set. Uh, I think there were just a couple of specimens from China and the rest of them were a single specimen from Japan and single specimen from Korea and a single specimen from US and Canada. Those are all very, very big places. And the likelihood that one specimen chosen at random from an entire country represents the, um, the, the molecular variability of that entire country is slim. So our goal was to basically sequence a lot more things, to build a true map of what the population genetics look like across the country. That's harder than it seems. Um, and the reason is, is because the, the sequencing technique, the molecular techniques that were chosen for this project need kind of high quality specimens. Getting high quality specimens from people that aren't really out to collect specimens specifically for that uh, purpose is, is very erratic. Like, here's a bunch of specimens received that were packed in honey for instance, um, um, if you find a, an old hornet that's been lying in the dirt somewhere, you know, you can probably pick it up and identify it as a hornet, but you can't get the quality DNA you want out of it because it is degraded to do population genetics at this level. When we were in Korea this summer, or, or this uh, fall really, our plan was towards the end of uh, our trip to take a, a quick drive, if you will, around the peninsula and maybe find six to eight sites, hang a trap, um, and then pick those up right before we left with the hornets in them. Six to eight sites isn't great, but it's a lot better than one. Once this was made clear to our collaborators, uh, Dr. Che right here in uh, South Korea from Kyungpook National University and Mr. Ma, a hornet hunter extraordinaire, they put the kibosh on that and said they had a better plan, which was to interact with this amazing network of people who catch hornets uh, in Korea. They do it both as a extermination services uh, and then also to harvest the hornets for traditional traditional medicines. And so we were able to connect, take a 600 mile, round, 600 mile drive, connect with all these like different hornet hunters and get specimens that they had collected and put directly into the freezer because that's the right way for them to store it to use for the traditional medicine um, products and, and build an amazing data set that way instead. And this, I mean, this group of people is just remarkable. Like I said, some of them, uh, um, you know, some, some of the focus is, is extermination. Some of the focus is traditional medicine. Some of the people like, uh, both this woman here and this guy are professional hornet hunters. That's essentially what they do all the time. Others are part-timers. This police officer is also a hornet hunter and was able to provide us with samples from, you know, his hornet hunting when he wasn't also policing. And we ended up with a much more complete picture, at least in terms of sampling breadth of of Korean hornet diversity. Uh, still a little weak in this sort of plains area near Incheon, Seoul, south of Incheon and Seoul, and and maybe in the the slopes um, moving towards North Korea, but way better than one. And in this case, we know exactly where each of those hornets uh, came from. Even better, um, and something we're hoping to exploit more this year, we learned that um, that these hornet hunters are in the position to create an incredibly detailed 
data list of where every single hornet nest is. So these yellow dots that just popped up were all um, nests collected by one hornet hunter. Um, and, and these were just the ones he could remember, right? This wasn't necessarily like um, like his, his diary of, of hornet hunting, but all collected by one hornet hunter. Um, what this what this means is that if we tap into this and, and then each one of these points gets surrounded kind of by a yellow, you know, a yellow uh, population of, of hornet nests like that, we can create a, a data set that shows us exactly where hornet nests are located. So not only sort of generally near a city or something like that, but but in this particular pile of grass or in this particular tree or or next to this exact field. Uh, and then we can use that to to create a habitat suitability model of nest selection site that may be useful for eradication. Now we may do this and it just finds out that hornets nest wherever they can, any old place that they don't get stepped on and they don't you know catch on fire or drown or any other things that might uh, befall a hornet will work and and so it might not be informative but it's kind of an amazing opportunity to create create a very detailed um, look at hornet nest selection uh, by just collaborating with people that are already creating this data so a total unexpected bonus of the trip and one that i think will, uh, is going to work out pretty interestingly okay so the main reason we had uh spent time in Korea, though, was not um, to test the traps. That was something that could be sent and done remotely. Um, you know, you don't need me there to do that. Uh, and not necessarily to collect those specimens we just showed either. But it was to really understand better how hornets hunt, to how, how hornets are using the landscape. Um, and one of the things we learned in the lags between, I'm going to make that Oh, I don't think I can make it quieter. No, we can. In the lags between um, when we found nests in 2021 and when we're able to remove nests in 2021 is that if you tag a hornet, but don't otherwise damage it or, um, or, or stress it out, it will continue to forage normally, like as normally as, as we think a hornet can with the thing tied onto it. And so in this case, this is the hornet that we followed back to the nest, uh, the first nest of 2021. It took a while to actually locate the nest and then work with the landowner to, to get permission to get into the nest. In the meantime, she kept returning to this uh, paper wasp nest over and over again. Um, she'd actually cleaned it all out, but still kept coming back and then flying back to the to to her actual nest. So about a 20 minute round trip journey, including you know intra nest time. And then that part there is the person filming that running away from the hornet as she flies by. And if you look at this funny box up on the tree, that's actually a microphone. This was on the last nest of 2021. Uh, we also had a pretty long lag between locating that nest and removing it because we had to figure out how we were going to get it out of this 15 foot tree without breaking the tree open and having hornets just fly all over the place. Uh, in that lag, we were able to hang this microphone and learn that um, that there's some pretty well-defined diurnal periods to hornet hunting. Um, they, they kind of peak in the morning and then there's a lag and then they peak again in the afternoon. So some things about hornet behavior that might lend itself to understanding how uh, what, what we find in traps, where best to hang traps, uh, how to interpret those trap results and how to best do live trapping. So the idea way to do this, or no, I shouldn't say the ideal way to do this, but I think the, the way that just occurs to you out the gate to do this, if you wanted to understand what hornets were doing is to find a hornet nest stand far enough away from it so they don't sting you. And then when the hornets fly away, run after the hornets and see where they go. That is not very efficient. We don't really have people that have time to stand around and do that. And the chances of you following the hornet properly every time are low. Uh, instead, we're going to use try to use this tagging techniques, these tagging approaches that are pretty modern um, to have that all automated for us. And we did that in Wisong, South Korea. So there's the Korean Peninsula. North Korea up here, this little star is the place where we did this work. A wee song is known for its garlic. Uh, it's famous for its garlic collection, like the, the bus stops and the city hall there are all shaped like garlic. It's very garlic, garlic forward town. Um, and we use that site because it was selected by our, our collaborators at Kyungkook National University. It turns out that we can't just throw or, or start working with hornets anywhere. Pe people take them seriously enough that if it was known that we had a hornet nest that we were babying in some park or side of the road, and not doing the responsible thing and removing it, and then somebody got stung, we would be in big trouble. So instead, we had to find this kind of interesting private uh, property up on top of a of a small mountain in Wisong. Uh, this is the view, essentially, from our research area. It's a really interesting landscape. It's used by, despite what I just said about um, having to be thoughtful about where we would mess with hornet nests, it's used by a lot of people for a lot of different things. 
Uh, there is uh, goat livestock grazing that occurs up there. There are some tree fruit plantations kind of scattered around. Uh, there are lots of cemeteries or, or small grave areas. That's what we're looking at here, sort of a family grave plot. Uh, people use it for timber harvest, and then people use it for traditional medicine um, gathering. So very much a, a cultural landscape in that it's wild, it's been impacted by war, and then it's been used by human beings for you know thousands of years uh, in such ways that, that, that shape it differently than if you were, say, like a national park that nobody ever went to. Um, our Korean collaborators weren't real keen on just trying to find a nest. So they took matters into their own hand and essentially installed three nests. They did this by capturing queens in the spring and raising them in these Langstroth hive boxes. So the same kind of bee boxes you would have in your backyard if you, were, uh, if you weren't doing a top bar hive. Um, and then installed three of them at, at our research site. And you can kind of see, this gives you a feel for how, how variable that land is. This is sort of down in one of the abandoned orchards. This is in a very wild spot of the research area. And then this is in what used to be a, a pigsty um, and is now just sort of in a collecting area for, for debris. So we had these built-in hornets uh, and built-in hornet nests that we could use. And our approach for tracking their daily behavior was based on equipment from cellular tracking technologies. So it's a kind of a recentish company that is pushing the envelope in terms of shrinking um, shrinking uh, radio tags that can be used for wildlife research and, and making it possible to automate data collection over large areas for a long time. And it rests on these sort of three, uh, three pieces of technology. The first one is a sensor station. This is a main computer with a big antenna. And its job is to collect information from these radio tags over here all the way on the right or from these sensor nodes. The sensor nodes are smaller sort of receivers um, that can pick up radio tag data, but only at, at a distance of, say, a couple hundred meters. Uh, but then they're strong enough to report that back to the sensor station. Um, and then, of course, and I'll come back to how those work in just a second. And then, of course, we have these UHF radio tags. Um, these are 0.31 grams, which is pretty big for a, an insect, frankly, an insect tag. Uh, it's incredibly small for a wildlife monitoring tag. I mean, this, these were made to go on to sparrows and songbirds and snakes and lizards and things like that. Uh, I think it's only been used for Mormon crickets before we started using it in terms of insect use. Uh, still kind of big, but we know that the hornets can carry that. And we know that because, again, while we were waiting around to take down Nest 4, Vikramire um, at University of Washington's professor in uh, computer science and engineering, um, and I were, were playing with some Bluetooth tags that he attached. And we noticed that the Bluetooth tags we attached, uh, the hornets again would like forage what seemed to be normally. They would go to the nest, um, return to the nest with some ball of, of insect goo or something like that, and then fly away with their tag dangling. And it turns out that those tags weighed about 0.3 grams. So exactly the same as these, um, these cellular technology tags. So the steps are to first install this sensor station, and that's um, that's what this little box is right here. That's the computer uh, on, a, on a sort of centralized area um, of your research site. You erect these antennae. There are four antennae that do four different things. The tall antenna, this omnidirectional antenna, picks up data from those nodes that I will come back to yet again in a second. And then these Yagi antennas that are directional will pick up data from the tags themselves. Um, and the whole thing is powered by a, a solar solar panel. And in this case, it's being installed on top of the water tank that waters the goats. Um, so a little bit of concern here. We had to be very thoughtful about our cables to make sure that they were tall enough off the ground so that the goats didn't eat them. So the next step is to install these sensor nodes. And you do that by creating a regular grid around the sensor station. Uh, so here's one of us walking through the uh, through the jungle, uh, not the jungle, but the forest with a hundred meter rope. We selected a hundred meters as the internode distance. So we created a, um, so we, we created this grid with these spaced every hundred meters. And, and that meant we had to walk wherever the rope told us to go or wherever the compass told us to go. So we spent a lot of time clambering through incredibly scratchy plants. Uh, and then at each location, we would put the node on a pole that was about uh, eight, eight to 10 feet tall. Um, once we did that, we then learned that even though the forest cover was pretty sparse, um, sometimes the, you know, they would end up under the trees, but it seemed like the trees still let in a lot of sunlight. It wasn't enough sunlight to, uh, to power the solar, uh, the solar panels that run those little nodes. So we found ourselves going back and removing a lot of trees, removing nodes. So all in all, it took, um, probably a week and some change 
to install this this grid. Uh, the terrain that we're on here is in, is is a lot like sort of West Virginia in that it's uh, comprises lots of folded ridges that are really tightly packed, and so you're kind of constantly going up and down. Um, and it turns out our colleagues had to go back and, and mess with that even more after the uh, after the cyclone that blew through. Uh, but we ended up at the end of the end of all of that with a grid that more or less looks like this. So the blue stars are our three experimental nests. Um, the sensor station is not marked on here, but it's about where my arrow is right now. And then each of those um, each of those little dots is a node tower. Um, and so this is after they'd been moved a couple times. And you can see like there are some gaps. Like this is down in a valley, and it was just so. Uh, so steep that there was no way for the node and the sensor station to communicate. There was not a, a good enough line of sight to get that signal over the ridge. So, uh, so we we're constrained to some degree by the geography of where we were. Once this node grid is installed, you then have to build essentially a test model where you um, you build a a known location data set by walking around with an activated tag standing by nodes or standing at random places in the forest um, and then holding the tag at different heights, different elevations uh, to try and capture the differences in Hornet um, in Hornet flight uh, activity. Uh, and do that for several hundred points so that you can create a known model of tag node communication that can then be used to interpret the actual tags that the Hornets are flying around uh, with. So. Um, and it, it is it really is kind of node specific. Like I said, some of the, the geography there is really um, really severe. And so a node might not pick up a tag that's 80 feet away because of where you are on on the ridge versus uh, a node that's in a different place could pick it up much farther. So it was a really important step to get reliable data. And what's going on here is I'm holding a, um, a two meter pole as high above my head to mimic sort of high flying hornets. After that, we tagged hornets, uh, and this occurred several times throughout the season. The goal was to have multiple tagging events. Uh, hornets only live for a few weeks. The lifespan of the tags should be several weeks, but as we found out, um, there's more to consider there. Uh, but to tag several batches of hornets every few weeks, and we did it very similarly to the way we tagged hornets in Washington State. Um, we would kind of tie the uh, we would tie the tags closely around the pediole. So that it was carried underneath the hornet. This mimics nor normal flying behavior um, and, and tries to get that string away from the hornet so they can't chew the, the tag off. Gluing the tags onto the hornets is kind of a non-starter. It, um, it just It's too difficult. The tags are too bulky uh, and, it, and they won't stay. We did measure all the hornets to try and um, come up with a, uh, a relationship between hornet size and any observed foraging activity. Uh, we chilled the hornets, used the same approach we did in Washington State, just kind of kept them in a cooler until they were cold enough to move, and then tried to do this all quickly before they woke up. Uh, there we go. And this, uh, so, so we were initially going to do this just with workers and then maybe queens. But when we returned in October, let me turn this down a little bit more, it was right at the beginning of mating season. And so we noticed, oops, let me go back, sorry. Um, so these are male swarms just hovering around the, uh, the nest waiting for a queen to emerge and then the males try to like chase her and, and initiate mating. Uh, and we just got curious if these males were moving back and forth between nests or if they hung out with, uh, or if they just hung out at one nest once they picked one. And so we ended up tagging some males too. And here's, you know, here's kind of how that was looking as, as we learned a lot more, like this was early on as, as uh, we and our colleagues became better at, at cinching it up tight to the, um, to the abdomen. This one's a little bit loose. Here's one where the way the tag was tied didn't work out well and they were able to slough it off. Um, at the end of the, at the, end of the pro program for this summer, we had tagged 53 workers, seven males and 10 queens. Uh, we had some tags that arrived as duds. So they were being replaced by the company, which is great. We'll use them again this summer. We found out that the tags usually broadcast for a week, but sometimes only a few days. Um, that's giving off a beep every five to 10 seconds. These are pretty fast uh, beep intervals. They, they do drain the battery quickly, but since the Hornets are short-lived, there's no point in, in stretching it out to uh, hours or anything like that. Um, and even just that short array of time, we have over 9 million tag data points that we were actually still still sorting into analyzable uh, bins. It's, it's just this tremendous amount of data for, for us. 
Uh, and we learned that maybe some of the reasons that the some of the tags only lasted a few days have a lot more to do with Hornet behavior than um, <laughs> than the tags themselves. This was a tag that was found in one of the Hornet nests. You can see that they have cut off the antenna. They have chewed away at this thing constantly. So there's probably a natural lifespan for these tags that has um, that has to do with Hornet tolerance rather than uh, how robust the tags are themselves. Um, and again, like the better you tie the tag, the more effective it is. But even with that, these tags are just big enough that the hornets can flip them around and bite off the antenna sometimes. And then, then you lose a lot of your transmission uh, capability. It'll, the nodes will still pick it up when they're very close, but that means that there's going to be a lot of blank spaces in your grid. Um, there we go. So those tags are pretty like we have a lot of promise for the data we're going to we have a lot of hope for the data we're going to get from them um, but there are some things about them that are problematic one is that they're expensive uh, so so there's a ceiling to how many of these tags we can afford to put on hornets and then the other one is even though we think the hornets can carry them they're big um, it's a it's a, a hefty chunk of thing to fly around with both uh, aerodynamically and, and probably in terms of sheer mass uh, and so we added to our attempts to understand Hornet behavior, and this is mostly relevant at the nest level by using RFID tags and RFID gates. So these are like pit tags, if you're familiar with uh, fish biology, uh, and basically the same kind of thing as a microchip that you might have in your dog. Um, these are really advantageous because they're inexpensive. They're more like $10 a tag. Um, they are pretty robust. It's a, a self-contained glass capsule that even even as strong as hornets are, no no matter of chewing, no no amount of chewing can break it, uh, and they are small enough that they can be glued right on the back of the thorax, so it makes it um, even more difficult for the hornets to to dislodge. The drawbacks are that excuse me, unlike uh, those radio tags, which can uh, transmit and receive signals or or can give off a signal that can be detected at several hundred feet, these have to be detected within uh, just a few inches. So. To do that, what we did is we created an RFID gate. So this is a two antennas. It's it's uh, circular. The hornets would have to walk through it. We pushed it up against the nest entrance at one of the nests, and it trips gate one as it's coming in, and then it trips gate two. And when you have these two gates that can create a sense of directionality, you can know, looking at the remote data, when the hornet has left the nest and then when it's returned back to the nest. Um, kind of the same process. We would chill our hornets use a, a knife to scrape off. They have a lot of hair on their thorax. Use the knife to scrape off the hairs and glue the tag on really quickly and, and also weigh them and measure them while we're doing it at the same time. Um, this is one that, uh, that actually bit and stung me. And so she lost her head when I brushed her off my ankle, uh, but it's just a good example of where the, that tag sits. And then this is what that, um, what that RFID gate looks like right at the, uh, the hornet nest. Oh, yeah. um, you know, or like mammals. I think this is just a gratuitous movie of, of hornets warming up um, in the sun. So we would basically capture them, chill them, do all the stuff to them, glue the tag on, and then leave them out here with some apple juice to warm up and uh, and fuel up to recover. Oh, this is a, uh, speaking of gratuitous slides, I think this is just a slide that shows that there's like a some fancy science stuff going on. Essentially, we have to store this um, this uh this rfid reader in a in a plastic box kind of far from the nest maybe not quite as far as we wish but um but pretty far so that you don't have to put on a hornet suit every time you collect it to collect data the data should have been available over bluetooth which was great that's how we were able to set it up and then mysteriously the bluetooth quit working yes in the middle of a mountain in the middle of korea in the middle of a garlic um of a garlic growing community, we suddenly had a computer program that problem that we couldn't fix. So after that, we did have to actually go to the box every day and download the, the data manually. Uh, we're getting this fixed. Um, but it's a video just demonstrating that the um, the gate that we set up didn't really interfere with the hornet's ability or um, or behavior of coming in and out of the of the nest. They were quite happy to fly through that gate and fly back into the gate. We were worried that adding something um, to the nest might confuse them because they use a lot of visual signals we know from research in Japan to orient on um, their nest when they when they leave. So uh, that was a concern, but it was a concern that was obviated by their subsequent normal behavior. Um, I don't know why it's not advancing. There we go. Uh, and one interesting thing that happened was uh, we had a hornet who liked the apple juice so much that she just kept coming back. Um, 
it took us a little bit to realize it was the same hornet, but she would return every 20 minutes. Again, it's that same kind of distance from the nest um, or like inter, inter nest visits that we observed in Washington every 20 minutes or so and slurp up the apple juice. If, uh, if her sisters were there, that was fine. They would happily slurp up the apple juice together. We did notice when we started tagging some males that she would relentlessly attack them. Um, and in fact, we had to come up with a new release site for the males because she would attack them while the glue was still drying and they were still warming up and either, either damage them or knock the tag off. This is interesting. This is a behavior we think we can exploit uh, by looking at some bait stations at different distances and with different baits from the nest, uh, but that's still in the planning stages for next year. Um, the RFID tags didn't really get set up until the very last few days of this entire research project. And that was that was a supply chain issue. We just could not get the reader in time. Um, we had tried with some of the old yellow cheese blocks. You may have seen, seen these like from the 90s that uh, uh, that we used to use for fish um, for fish pit tag reading, but <laughs> they worked when I was given them and then immediately stopped working once we got to Korea, but they were super old, so it was okay. Um, Again, but even in just that one or two days, I guess it was two days, we had over 200,000 individual reads. Part of that is, is we're still dialing in the antenna sensitivity so that um, when a hornet's crossing the antenna, you might get like seven reads when really you only need one, but it was still, it was quite a lot. Most of the hornets that we tagged were detected um, by one gate. So that means that they actually went, went back to the nest. So that was good. Um, we tagged a lot of males, kind of the same question about like how much do males move between um, between nests and it looks like, and, and this is data we're still analyzing, it looks like males are loath to enter the nest. They'll come near and trip that first gate, but wouldn't or seldom would go all the way into the nest. And when they did, it seemed like they came out in a big hurry. Um, and then finally, we're still dialing in the glue bit. Some of the, some of the hornets just dropped the tag and we found it in the dirt um, near the release site. So one final thing we're doing, and so some of the data we'll try to get from this are mainly understanding nest, uh, the duration of, of visits outside the nest. So when we were observing nests in Washington and, and in Korea, there are a lot of different kind of colony tasks that hornets undertake. One of them is going out to forage for either nest building materials um, or food for the larvae. One of them is removing debris from the nest, like a dead hornet gets drug out of the nest or or excavating the ground underneath the nest. So when we were working on the first nest in Washington, for instance, there were lots of uh, pictures of kind of cute little hornets or videos of cute little hornets running out of the nest with a ball of dirt, throwing it in a pile and then running right back in. So these very short duration visits. Uh, and then hornets will also hang outside the nest and fan um, or hang outside the nest and, and look formidable if they uh, if they think some alarm pheromone is, is worth checking out. Uh, and those are the kind of information that the RFID tag will, data will give us. Um, it'll tell us how often hornets leave the nest, um, how long their trips are, and we can use that to, to sort of infer whether or not hornets switch back and forth between tasks. For instance, um, in, in honeybees, right, there are sort of these well-defined periods of their life cycle where they're sort of like hanging out in the hive bees versus going out and foraging bees. Uh, it's not clear that hornets have that kind of breakdown in terms of, of their age, but um, this gives us, a tech, uh, gives us the opportunity to study that at a pretty fine scale. So the plan for next year is we will, now we have all the equipment set up, we will go early in the season, we will open the nests and then just tag as many of the worker hornets as we can that will not get a radio tag. Uh, and so that means we're catching hornets at multiple life stages. Um, ideally, we'll be able to recognize and, and individually mark the ones that have just emerged so we can follow it through its entire life. Uh, and then finally, the other thing um, that we implemented was using timed video cameras to record hornet behavior at different uh, periods every day. So, so the way we have it set up is during um, during the hornet active period, which is about an hour before sunrise to an hour after sunset. This takes 30 minute or 30 seconds of video every um, every half an hour. And then one of my technicians sat and coded all this behavior. So for instance, in this case, she would have coded um, you know, a hornet just loitering. Nobody doesn't look like anybody flew out or flew back in during the time we were sitting here. Um, and then, and then the number of hornets that were swarming. And, and the way you would do that is pause it and just count the number of individual hornets, the highest number of individual hornets you could see in one frame, because uh, it's too hard to try and count, catch them out there. And so there was a hornet that came out and forged away. So these are the kind of behaviors we can code looking at the visual data. 
and then combine that with the pit tag data because um, in in inevitably some of these hornets that are pit tagged will come out and we will see we will see them actually doing the behavior as well as get the pit tag information um, and same with the radio tags and all of that will be sort of this trifecta of understanding colony behavior and foraging over the summer. All right, I think this is the last uh, experiment that we tried to implement. And um, that is using tethered flight mills, exactly like a um, uh, a treadmill. Thanks, like trying to think, what is it that humans do? We don't fly. Yeah, exactly like a treadmill uh, to sort of understand the maximum physiological capacity of hornets. So this is kind of a tricky technique, right? Like you can't necessarily use this to compare to um, another species, for instance, uh, because the, the conditions are really artificial, but you can use it to understand how often hornets fly, how long do they fly before they stop, um, and like what is the speed that they fly, and what is the maximum flight distance they can engage in before they die. Uh, and we can use that. The, the real interest in doing this is trying to understand queen dispersal. Um, one of the challenges we had, have had as a program is quite is understanding how far to cast our, our trap net, if you will, uh, how far to, to establish our trapping grid on the landscape after we collect a hornet. Um, there really aren't any data that I know of in the literature that address queen dispersal capabilities. Uh, and so this maybe would give us some insight into that. Um, and we're, um, yeah, we're doing this in collaboration with, uh, USDA, um, SciTech and Otis lab. And so the simple, the approach is we have these carbon fiber arms to which a hornet is tethered on one side and then a little um, piece of foil is tethered on the other side. And every time a complete revolution uh, occurs, it that foil trips the sensor. Um, and and there you go. That's your basic measure of of the number of the number of times it went around, the speed at which it went around, um, and and how long it went around before stopping. Uh, the the hornets are flying in one meter uh, circles right now. So every one of those every one of those revolutions is a meter. So you see the one sort of the third one down is really. Uh, really animated, and the hornet right above it is quite lazy. Um, this, again, took surprisingly more finesse to get it to work. Um, here you see this male, and that shows kind of how he's how we how we set the apparatus up. We glued the straw to um, to his thorax, and then inserted that on this um, this little tiny Allen wrench that was glued to the arm. The initial design called for this to be uh, straight up and down, and basically you ended up with these hornets that were looking at the sky and and just like wouldn't fly. They were, it was like they were confused or their signals didn't work. So Dr. Che and uh, an undergraduate that was working with him kept fiddling with it and eventually fi figured out that if we put it at this slight angle, then the hornets are sort of looking straight ahead and they will fly and fly and fly. Uh, the approach is to let them fly until they stop. Then you give them a, a wad of food of some kind, apple juice, honey water, it doesn't really matter, just some sort of sucrose, um, some sort of fuel for them to keep flying. Uh, take it away from them after five minutes if they haven't dropped it already and let them keep flying and do this until they stop. So it's incredibly time consuming. Um, this, this summer when we do this, we will do it at the site and there will be a, an undergraduate dedicated to running this experiment. Uh, it should go pretty well. And our main interest is looking at the differences between mated and unmated queens and queens that are flying in the fall and queens that are flying in the uh, summer or this, sorry, the spring. Um, we'll probably throw some workers on as well, but I, I don't know if we'll get as much information that's useful out of that. And uh, same with the males, although it's amazing how, how much the males would fly. They would just fly and fly for days. Um, so here's here's the one queen that we got to, to fly pretty consistently. Um, stink. And yeah, they do stink. Sorry, I probably should have edited that out. They smell really bad. Um, for this experiment, she spent 30% of the time in the flight mill flying and 70% of the time just, you know, not flying, staying there. There we go. Um, she flew up to 1.25 meter, 1.26 meters per second. The males actually flew faster, but those data were pretty erratic because we we're also trying to figure out how to use the software. Uh, and she flew for about an hour. Um, there was only one worker that we were able to successfully test at this time, and she flew for much um, a, a much shorter amount of time and like less time overall, uh, kind of about the same speed. Um, one thing that's not clear though, and and this experiment will be relocated from the center of Daegu, which is very far away, to the actual research site, is how much impact it had 
uh, on the Hornets by collecting them and then driving for an hour and then fixing them to this. So that's why these are sort of preliminary data. Um, I, I don't think they necessarily mean a lot just yet. Okay, so that's sort of the sum of stuff. We're gonna, we are all set up now with our grid. We understand how to hook these tags up to the Hornets and get the most out of them before they chew the tags to, to bits. The RFID setup is ready to go and be paired with uh, photo data. And we are transferring all of the flight mills up to the, um, up to the research station. And the other additional thing is, yeah, we'll be collecting some nest location data from our Hornet trapping colleagues. Um, to see if we can model nest selection really, really uh, at a really fine scale. The one super encouraging thing that may change all of this is that the company Cellular Tracking Technologies that made the tags we were using is just about to release a tag that weighs one fourth of, of the tags we were using. They are much smaller. I don't know if you can see um, the tag before. I didn't have, I grabbed this off of a screen. This is a screen capture from a conversation we were having, so I didn't have a tag to compare it to. It's probably half again as wide and long. Um, these are solar powered, so that's one reason they weigh so much less. They don't have to have a big Horkin battery to, to do the signaling. Um, and, and they can also add a, a little bit more robust antenna um, to the Hornets uh, that maybe will, um, maybe will minimize them chewing the antenna off, although their, their mandibles are really sharp. We're pretty excited about this. We're hoping they'll be ready at least halfway through the experimental season this year. Uh, it will start in July, but if we can even get these on by the beginning of September, I think we'll get some much better data. And I feel a lot more confident that these um, will collect data for longer and will have less of an impact on the Hornets flying itself. So super exciting. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know that I've ever been excited about a tiny radio tag being produced, but I'm excited about this one and I kind of can't wait, wait for them to be in my hands. That is the overall uh, summary of what we've been up to this summer. Um, hopefully we have time for questions. And here's Sven Eric Spiesiger, managing entomologist on Korean TV uh, as part of a documentary about how we were working with a uh, Korean scientists to understand invasive, uh, invasive hornets. And I will um, stop sharing and return to my meeting window. Cassie, you're muted for me. I don't know if you are for anybody else. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so now if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and post them in the chat box. Um, we can bring them up for Dr. Chris Looney to answer. Um, also, if you at this time would like to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do that as well. Okay, so we'll go ahead and still, if you have any questions, again, feel free to post them in the chat box. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll kind of get started wrapping up the webinar. Like I said, um, it's really important, all this work that we're doing overseas, amongst all this work that we're doing in Washington. However, you citizens um, have work that you can do as well. So if you ever happen to um, see a hornet or something, we need your help. Before we move forward, there is a question in the chat box um, for you, Chris. Um, it's wondering about when the team's going to be heading back. When is the team going to be heading back next spring? Uh, the plan is to go back in July. So when we went the previous year, and it was really complicated this year because because Korea was still sort of uh, figuring out how to manage uh, COVID travel, um, certainly for certainly for outsiders, uh, but even domestically. Um, and so we kind of grabbed our chance when we could, and we got there before the experimental nests were established. Um, it was great. We actually turned out we needed all that time to set up the grid anyway. So, but the, the plan this year is to go back sort of mid to late July. Uh, this will be after they have um, have some, some new hornet nests up at the research site, and we'll hit the ground rolling then. Um, is there an anticipated number of hornet nests you plan on studying? Are you going to keep the same kind of three, or do you have any idea? 
Uh, I, I would like to stay with three. That seemed like a pretty good amount. Uh, Dr. Che had, had talked about doing up to five. Um, I think his concern was just in case one fails, but but three seemed like a good study amount. We, we only have so many tags, so you get to a point where uh, you can't benefit from adding yet more nests. So if there were a dozen nests up there, you know, that just means we ignore 10 of them. Um, and, and then the other concern is if we pack in the nests too um too closely i guess on the on the research site we might in, in end up interfering with their behavior that way by by creating like sort of more intranest or internest competition but three is the target Sam, well thank you um this is also being streamed over youtube um so we did have a couple questions come through here and in the chat box but um some of our co-hosts were able to answer those questions as well so as we're moving forward into season four, um, and our entomologists are gonna be doing all this work overseas, there's still work to be had here in Washington, right? Um, as citizens, if you ever happen to see a hornet, um, what do you think you should do? So if you ever suspect to see a Northern giant hornet, your job is to report that sighting. And there's various different ways you can report that sighting. You can go online to our website, you can send us an email and you can also call our hotline. Remember in those first years, those public detections are crucial for helping us finding the nest. In addition to um, not just reporting hornets, um, we're also going to be asking you to trap again this upcoming year. So trapping in Washington will start in July and it will run through November. However, before we get to trapping, way early in the spring, there is the chance for you to get your eyes open and start looking out for those hornets. And you can start looking for hornets early in the spring. You may see a queen. However, those numbers won't really bump up until she has workers out in July. For that being said, in between that spring and that, um, that beginning trapping time, what you can do is you can go see if you have any paper wasp nests out and about. Remember, as Dr. Looney mentioned, that one queen hornet, she kept on going back and back, or I'm sorry, the one worker hornet kept going back and back to raid the paper wasp nest. So beginning in the spring, moving through the summer and into the fall, as you're looking and as you're trapping, the other thing you can do is check paper wasp nests and see if you see a larger insect on it that could be a potential northern giant hornet. The last thing to do as citizens is really stay connected. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can sign up to receive our Hornet Heralds um, through our email listserv. You can keep up on the headlines by reading our blogs and our press releases. So the best way to do that is to go online to our website. Uh, click from your computer, your phone, tablet, or any device. The website we're gonna keep on using is that AGR wa.gov slash hornet. From that homepage, as you scroll down, you'll see a section that says, click this link to sign up for the programs listserv. And that way we'll keep you informed with email updates on what's going on with the program. Other thing you can do is if you're into social media, there is a group on Facebook that's ran by the Washington State Department of Agriculture titled Washington State. Now, we appreciate you attending this webinar, asking questions and learning all this information. I want to thank you for taking that time out of your day. But remember, we're not out of the woods yet. We're going to be doing lots of things this upcoming season to make sure there really aren't any hornets out there. The last thing to mention is that if you're in the area, WSDA will be at the upcoming Whatcom Farm Expo Saturday, March 4th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. This is a free event and it's at the Northwest Washington Fairgrounds in Linden. With that being said, thank you for attending um, and we'll look forward to talking to you more as the season gets closer.